Welcome to the New York City inaugural Conversations with Great Women. I'm Rona Carr. I'm a board member and I'm the chairwoman of the New York City Committee for the National Women's Hall of Fame. This evening we're at the Gilbane Building Company, sponsor of the conversation with Joan Gans Cooney. Mrs. Cooney is the co-founder of Sesame Workshop and the creator of Sesame Street. Celebrating the achievements of American women is one of the most important educational programs that the National Women's Hall of Fame offers the public. It celebrates not only the achievements of the women who've been inducted, but it also informs them about their life's work. Inducted in 1998, celebrating the 45th anniversary of Sesame Street, Mrs. Cooney will be interviewed by the award-winning 60 Minutes correspondent, Leslie Stahl. We are very honored to have Mrs. Cooney and to celebrate her achievements and the occasion, her achievement as a visionary, as a pioneer, and as an American woman. I just wanted to welcome everyone uh, to our office. My name is Bill Gilbane, and on behalf of everyone in the Gilbane family, including my sister Brennan and all the employees that are with us today, uh, we want to welcome you to our home here in Lower Manhattan. Uh, Welcome Leslie and welcome Joan. We've been very excited uh, about this day. The hall, and in particular the Seneca Knitting Mill, is a special place for Gilbane. We've been involved with several years with some, I'll call them family members on the board, and our recent role in stabilizing the mill um, has been wonderful. I had the pleasure of meeting most of the board this summer at my home in Skaneateles, where we had a similar uh, get out the uh, information on the mill. It's a special honor for us to have both of you women here uh, this evening. Joan, I was at your dinner for the 9-11 memorial where Rosita and Elmo uh, <laughs> played a, a, a big role this year at the 9-11 Museum and Memorial Board. Congratulations to you and your husband on that award. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jill. Uh, who's going to welcome us uh, here from the hall. But thank you to everybody that came, and we're really looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We really appreciate the hospitality of Gilbane. As Bill said, there are partners for the National Women's Hall of Fame. My name is Jill Tijan. I'm president of the board of directors of the National Women's Hall of Fame. And what he's talking about is an 1844 limestone building, which was developed as the Seneca Knitting Mill, developed by two men who were abolitionists and suffragists who signed the Declaration of Sentiments. They never used cotton in the mill, ever, from 1844 to 1999. It's on a branch of the Erie Canal in Seneca Falls. It's being redeveloped rehabilitated, excuse me, is the correct word. <laughs> it's a historic building as the Center for Great Women, and we are delighted to be here at Gilbane tonight. We are very pleased to have our conversation with great women with Joan Gans Cooney, one of our 256 amazing inductees. She saw a need and decided to change how and when we educated and entertained our children by creating Sesame Street, which celebrates its 47th anniversary this year. Was it 45? Well, I was called 47. Joan Gans Cooney changed America, as did Leslie Stahl. And after the evening's event is over, I have a copy of my book for each of you, which is called Her Story, A Timeline of the Women Who Changed America, both of you are in the book. Aww. I want to read that first. <laughs> <laughs> They're right here. The bags have your names on them. They're personally signed. <laughs> Leslie Stahl, as everyone here knows, is an award-winning news correspondent who informs and educates us all on a daily basis. And you're here this evening also to learn about the National Women's Hall of Fame. Oh, we already had this discussion, sorry. I'm an electrical engineer, I have to say this. For anyone who's in here, you know these lab mics? They're not designed for women's clothing. <laughs> <laughs> they are definitely not. 
They are not designed for women's clothing, and I'm sure no women were involved <laughs> in its design. The National Women's Hall of Fame, uh, I think you all got lapel pins. Many of you got membership applications. We'd love to have you join us. And by the way, the Center for Great Women, which we're rehabilitating with Gilbane, we've raised about the $5 million, at about the $5 million mark so far. We only need to get another $20 million. <laughs> so I'm welcome, I would welcome the opportunity to talk to anyone about that. There are many ways in which you can help. And with that, Leslie, I'm going to oh, wow. turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first off, I want to congratulate my friend Joan for being in the Women's Hall of Fame. And uh, I think we have to be up front, because Joan and I are friends. Uh, we're really good friends. We're not that air-kissing acquaintance <laughs> kind of friends. We're really friends, so that's, uh, that's for you to understand. And uh, Joan, I think that among all the women you and I know, and all the men that you and I know, and we know some pretty impressive men and women, you really stand out. And you stand out because you led a revolution. You're like George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you changed the way we educate our children. You changed our language and our vernacular. You changed what's funny. You changed, well, you put friendship in the middle of our values. Sesame Street changed our culture. And that's A, I have to read this, BFD, big friggin' deal. <laughs> so let's start by you telling us what the inspiration was for the Children's Television Workshop and then Sesame Street. What was your idea? Where did it come from? Well, it came from the uh, vice president of Carnegie Corporation, the foundation, who was a friend. And he was, oh, he and his wife were over for dinner one night with my then husband and me and my boss from Channel 13, where I was a producer, and a, a, a friend or two more. And so it was a small dinner, and my boss was this very articulate, dramatic, stunning man, and he got up and started talking about the educational potential of television and what it could bring to the world. It could bring the world to you. It could bring everything. And he, it was mesmerizing. And Lloyd. And this was a new thought. Well, no, it was just, he was so stunning in his saying that we were missing the boat already. This is 1966 that it, television was missing the boat already, that it could change, it could open the world and become this great educator. And that uh, it, he didn't say it's not doing that, it was just what it could be. And Lloyd, who was at Carnegie Foundation, was uh, in the midst of studying uh, funding studies on cognitive development in children. And he had a, a two little preschoolers, two babies, would that, I did know. And, and so he was thinking that he'd gotten up and found one of his daughters at age two watching test patterns one morning. In the old days, television was not 24-7. There was a test pattern at six in the morning that went on to about seven, and there was his little two-year-old just watching, watching, waiting patiently. Wow. And he, so he said, I guess kids like television. <laughs> <laughs> so the thought, something clicked in his mind. And he said uh, to me as he left, do you think television could educate preschool children? And I said, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to find out. And my boss, who wanted to keep me in my present position, said, well, Joan wouldn't be interested in pursuing that. And I remember kind of screaming out, oh, yes, I would. <laughs> I was looking for something really significant to do with television. So within time, I, we, he, we began having meetings at Carnegie talking about how this might go. And my boss kept saying, Joan's not interested. <laughs> I, kept, I kept having to say, yes, I am. 
<laughs> and finally had to have my husband get to Lloyd at Carnegie and say, you cannot listen to her boss. <laughs> she wants to do this study. It was to be three months where I'd take a little leave of absence and go all over the country talking to educators of young children to ask what they would think of a television show teaching preschoolers. Because if they had said, oh, television, not a chance, and you had just invited all that criticism, it would have hurt, hurt it from the beginning and probably prevented it from being a success. They, were, they all got it. This is 1966. The precursors of Head Start were just the government had, some, had funded some pilot projects. And I, I did a show on one of them called A Chance at the Beginning, which was very well received. And uh, then I went around the country and visited several more as well as other kinds of kindergartens and talked to endlessly to, to educators, cognitive scientists. A psychologist up in Canada probably made a decisive difference because I quoted him in the uh, study that I turned into Carnegie on the opinions of these people. And he had said, you know, it is thought that children, that sight is not, sight is not important important initially with children that it's doing things and he said from the almost from the day they're born they lead with sight oh. and that they learn from seeing things they don't have to be doing anything and that they copy behavior as they get older do you know something we do too i'm, I'm working in television if we see something it's the most it'll it'll stay with you much longer than things you read or hear yes so yes. it's it's just human. Yes. So he's so that that was in the study, and I think that really turned the tables because everyone was so sure, initially, that children had to do things, the Montessori where you have to do, and he said no 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 no, seeing is good enough. And that that turned the tide. I had heard though, just why you got so interested and involved is because a priest had told you when you were younger that idealists have to go into the media because if they don't, non-idealists will. Yes, <laughs> I think that's great. This was the Christopher movement. It had a huge effect on my life. Uh, I being a little Catholic girl at the time, it's not so much now, but... <laughs> <laughs> Want to talk about that? <laughs> But in any case, uh, the leader of the Christopher movement said that idealists must go into these influential media and into government and so on, because he said otherwise it's non-idealists that go into it. And it had a profound effect on me. And of course, television was relatively new uh, when I came to New York. It was in the early 50s. It was Everyone had a television set and were, were watching television, but there wasn't much on, and it was, uh, but it was, uh, it became the influence of my life when I well, saw, when I first saw television. But, but what is more idealistic than taking the medium and using it to educate not just you know, middle class kids, but to educate at disadvantaged kids. Well, that was the whole, I mean, w the government, which we desperately needed to help us, we needed, um, it turned out, eight. we decided $8 million to do this. Well, that would be like saying $50 million today. Right. So people were shocked that, ch that you'd spend that much money on children. I mean, it was... <laughs> because they were watching recycled cartoons and pie-in-the-face comedy in the afternoon. And the idea that you would spend that kind of money on mere children. But we were determined to get disadvantaged children and to try to make a difference. And most of our research was done on, uh, on disadvantaged children and whether they were learning what we were producing from so, what we were producing. So it, it, it's this report. It, moves forward so I do this and you finally become 
the executive director, you're the head of the project. Yes. And I think everybody here would like to know, this was back in the mid-60s, before affirmative action. Did you have any trouble becoming the head of this organization as a woman? It was just at the beginning of the women's movement. It was there, but not a big factor. And yes, there was the backers, which was the U.S. Department of Education, Ford Foundation, Carnegie, and the, and the newly created Corporation for Public Broadcasting, because public broadcasting is a real entity, a real network was just starting. And those were the sources of, of money that we needed. And it was the first person I heard about objecting to a woman heading such a project was a woman at the Ford Foundation. Wouldn't you know it? But it was sort of, she's both a woman and she's never run anything this big. This, and that, that was absolutely true. And so I was asked to draw up a list of men that I thought could head the project. No. It was your baby, and they're and saying you have to... I, so I said, I'll be glad to do it. Just understand this. I'm not going to be there if you choose someone other than me. And I remember <laughs> one of the men saying, oh, yes, you'd be deputy, and you, <laughs> you would eventually... Um, uh, that man wouldn't last forever, and you would eventually become head of it. I was married at the time to an radical feminist, the first I had ever known. I had never known a woman feminist, much less a man. Wow. Because Didn't you choose well? Huh? Yes. <laughs> it turned out I did on that score. <laughs> 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 and and uh, so he said, you just tell them that it's fine if they want to put someone else in it, but you won't be part of it. And so I said that, and, and I remember one of the men said, oh, yes, you'd be deputy, you'd eventually succeed. And I said, no, you don't understand. And I said, also understand this. This project is not on paper. It's here. So good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I never I love heard it. A, I never I heard it. a word. So this is how... I was an arrogant young person. <laughs> I don't have any of that now. <laughs> This is how Joan Gans Cooney became the first woman television executive in the United States, which probably means in the world. <laughs> yes, so there you go. So how, how did it gets on the air? How did you get Jim Henson and the puppets into oh, this? Oh, what a break that was. I, I had been called by a friend to go and see a reel of, of a man named Jen, Jim Henson's commercials which was all that he was doing at the time, appearing maybe on uh, Ed Sullivan. He was appearing on Ed Sullivan. And he was, did appearances on Saturday Night Live, too. Uh, funny pieces at the end of the show they were doing. But the world, so the inside world was very aware of him, the inside television world. But the general population, he was not a household name at, by a long shot. But because I saw this reel of his commercials and fair, almost fell into the aisle laughing. And were they puppets? Pu the yes, commercials puppets, were puppets. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not, not all ones like uh, ours, some of them very skimpy, not hairy monster. Everyone wasn't a hairy monster. But it was <laughs> hilarious and violent at times. I mean, <laughs> one, one puppet would take a cannon and blow the head off of another <laughs> as the punchline. Um, but in and you saw that and said, that's my man. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, well, I didn't. I, it, he was, even though not famous, way beyond reach in my view, and nearly, very nearly was. Jim, it turned out, did not want to do little kitty shows. He was terrified of being put in that box and never doing a show like The Muppet Show Family. He wanted to be a family entertainer, and he was terrified of doing a little kitty show. So he was very hard to talk into it. And he finally decided as a father of then four children and a, and a fifth came along later, um, that maybe he owed it to them to do this. 
And um, so we finally talked him into it. And of course, it, it made all the difference. We would not be here today if it weren't for being able to license the Muppets for income because that's how we live. Oh, it, we're wow. a nonprofit. And so wow. we, I hadn't even put that together. I just thought you meant, aren't we lucky because the show was so successful? Oh, because it wouldn't those have characters. been as successful, but we'd have no but, way of continuing either wow. without. So you, 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 you earn the money from the sales of everything. With we don't on get it. that much money. I mean, we still we're going to start a foundation because we need more money. We can't make it on just what the income is. From uh, it's not that huge. It's. I have another question. Yes. So, one of the things that Sesame Street. Well, let me first ask before I ask that. You you finally get on the air. Hard work, a lot of creativity, a lot of discussion. Um, and you start brilliant producers. I want to add brilliant producers. Clearly, clearly storytellers, but also you you start to handle sensitive issues. Yes. Now, how did why why did we you We didn't right away. But you eventually get there yeah. and you, I mean, I, the one that's very famous is dying, but you did yeah. very other sensitive and controversial sometimes. And mm -hmm. how did that come about and how how what would go into putting a show like that on? Well, we didn't, we tried to do divorce, for example, and the children were just traumatized by it. So we did not do divorce. Um, so we were very careful. We had a marriage, we had a baby in, from that marriage. We had Gordon and Susan adopt a child. So we dealt wow. with issues like that. But in, we, these are two and three and four year olds. You have to be a little, what you could do with seven and eights, you cannot do with sure. preschoolers. Yeah, You're, but oh, you did it. Them. You did dying, I remember. We did, and thank God, because I, we had a lot of experts come in and tell us uh, how to deal with it. Yes, they, they never. They, they couldn't do it together. No. No, that it broke up later over some other issue. <laughs> but like nothing else clear in explaining death to a child. So it, this grieving session on air was done for Mr. Hooper, who died, and people in, in the show were really crying. It was like a one take. Uh, oh, wow. So it was very moving. But I learned what you were supposed to say for wouldn't you know that I was taking care of my two and a half year old grandchild some years later and a close friend who was dying was living with us and died and she caught me sobbing and I said that I was so sorry that Anthony was so sick and that's why I was crying and finally uh, uh, within a night or two we were sitting having ice cream fairly late at night for her so it was like two people at a bar. <laughs> she's two and a half. And she's two and a half, and she looked straight at me and said, what happened to Anthony? And I knew I couldn't. So I thought, what did the experts say? What did the experts say? So fortunately, we are believers uh, in heaven, so that we were, that is very concrete for a child is that he's not coming back, but he's up in heaven and very happy. And he went there because he got very sick. And so she was totally satisfied. Years later, I told her my dog, little dog Floppy had died when I was little. She asked me what, about a sad event. And I said, we got him, he was killed by a car and we brought him home and buried him. She said, you buried him? I thought you said you went to heaven. <laughs> Uh, caught in a lie, caught in a lie. Oh, that's but worst. that's how Sesame Street has educated parents and, and, and caretakers on how to deal with some of these sensitive issues with children. And it's been very helpful. Well, I, 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 my sense is that Sesame Street, well, obviously innovative, but, but in a way brave for some of the issues that you've gone into because it, it tracks society in a way. Um, so, so you go on the air, and what were the initial reactions? Did, did it was 
a swoosh of adoration from the press, which can be fool you a little bit. The press adored it because they had been watching terrible material for children. In the New York Times, it was all front page, and I mean, it was just... Cover of Time magazine. Cover of Time, cover of Newsweek, Look magazine features, Life magazine features, because all those magazines were still publishing. Um, (laughs) (laughs) This was before television and the internet had taken over the world. Um, In any case, um, it it was a huge reaction from the press and from parents where we had some criticism was from academics who did not like what we were doing. They didn't like the, they didn't approve of all the research that was being done. They would nitpick. So you were telling the public what the research was, were you, in other words, talking to the Well, the researchers were publishing. They were independent. A number of them were independent. So you were criticized. It was kind of academic jealousy. Well, academics would argue with each other, but it would make the press. What is that great comment about people in in academia who argue with each other? Or little points is a great line. Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, let me read you some of the things that were written because I looked this up. Uh, in the first season, year one, you won three Emmys. You won the cover of Time. You won a Peabody, which is the highest television honor. Newsday wrote this: that scores of glowing newspaper and magazine stories fluttered fluttered down on Mrs. Cooney and her workshop like confetti onto the heads of conquering heroes. <laughs> <laughs> it was the way it, it was huge. It was just gigantic. And they start to call you Saint Joan. <laughs> <laughs> Variety did. <laughs> so um, you just kept going forward and expanding. And one of the things that people here may not know is that you started to go abroad. And you yes. developed shows in other countries, but you didn't they just... They came to us and asked us to. Germany came to us, and it shocked me. I thought we had done the quintessential hip 1960s television show. And they came and said, it turned out the Muppets were so international in appeal oh. that the Germans wanted the show, the Brazilians wanted the show, then Mexico wanted a But they didn't program. take your show and, and then just translate it. Oh, no, it. they created half hours there. And, all their own and, stuff. And all their own language and, and uh, new Muppets. We had new, each one had a different, they didn't have Big Bird and Cookie Monster. They had their, they made, they we made used, the, you the, made them the, for them. The Henson people made them for them. <sighs> And, and, they, and they would write them themselves to cater to their own Yes, we would meet cultures. with their educators and decide their goals. So how many countries have you been in? It's, it's enormous, right? Oh, I th- we've been in 180 countries, but not all of them with original co-productions. That may oh, be some, 80 or 90. Some did take your shows and just translated them. Yes, and a lot, a lot. Uh, uh, not dubbed, but a number played them in English. I forget how it all. Remember, the armed services took it, so that was for for armed the children of armed services, yeah. servicemen throughout the United throughout the world. I've seen uh, Sesame Street uh, videos, and there are children sitting out and like in the middle of the Serengeti. And they roll up a little television screen, and little kids sit around the yes. television screen, and they're just stunned, you know, in awe of this, and they're getting educated in their language. Yes. And then you've had some that have been controversial because you tried to do one, one show for Israelis and Palestinians. How did that work out? <laughs> Tell us About that story. About the same as it's worked out in real life. <laughs> What happened? No, it was... They wouldn't. They ended up not working together. I remember sitting in on a meeting with Palestinian Israeli producers and writers, and Israel had just done something, uh, invaded some place that, <laughs> that uh, made an encroachment someplace. So we sat in this meeting. Everyone was... The Palestinians were dead silent. 
And finally, they said to the Israelis, how can we cannot continue this meeting without discussing what's happened in mm -hmm. Lebanon or wherever the incursion was? And, the, and so you should provide a defense. And the Israelis, all of whom are, were liberals, these, you know, like young producers here, they're, they're not necessarily pro-government. And so one of them said, what makes you think we agree with our government? And that broke the ice. <laughs> so they went back to so work. So we went back to work. But didn't they end up with two separate shows? Oh, yes. They, they never. They, they couldn't do it together. No. No. That but, it broke up later over some other issue. <laughs> but, you know, I think. But we've done Palestinian. I mean, we have done Arabic shows and we have done Israeli shows, right. but not one show, which right. we and, had hoped for. But that makes sense. So here's the main question. Who's your favorite character? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hard. It, it would have been, in many ways, it's Ernie, because that's Jim Henson. And Ernie I was, er, is Jim Henson? You mean his personality? He, he, was the, he, oh, he was the voice. He was the voice I see. and the character, and Frank Oz was Bert. And I loved Ernie, and I, and, and so every, now, of course, it's not Jim's voice. It's someone who sounds like him, but it's not the same to me. But I always loved anything Jim did. Any, any you loved he him did. personally. Oh, I just really? adored him. Yeah. It was, was the, It was one of the worst losses we ever suffered, I ever suffered. Who took over? Who's, who's the new Jim? Is there someone who well, has... Well, remember, his... Disney owns it now. Oh, I'm I, not remembering it because I didn't know it. So Disney bought... Disney bought the, those Muppets, and we, but you still we, have... bought, we bought our Muppets. So it ended up the way Jim oh, originally oh. wanted it, but after many lawsuits and trouble and problems. And so any of the new puppets out of that shop are Disney's, and the ones that had already been created for you are yours. Yes, and we can create... And the, the, the Henson shop will create new Muppets for us any time, but they become Sesame Street Muppets. Now, you created other shows. Sesame Street's not the only one. You have um, Electric, Electric Company. Company. It was a big hit back and was used. It was the most widely used program in classrooms in the United States. In the class? Well, that's for in, older kids? In, it was a half hour, and so it was largely used in cafeterias at lunchtime oh. and for after school, uh, rainy days. But it was the most widely seen in classrooms. We were not. We did a new version of that, completely different, in the last uh, three or three years, and it's on PBS in the afternoon. But it never <coughs> caught. We were never able to sell it to schools. It, the situation has changed in schools. They're still. They use some digital. They use some iPads, of course, and they and they use smart boards to show uh, pieces of from. Uh, of television type material, uh, but they don't. It, getting them to air a half-hour show now would be unthinkable. There, it never changes. It never changes. <laughs> well, it does. It changes a lot, actually. I went to visit uh, oh. to show you how wrong the thinking is. I think on on uses of television and pieces of television. I'm not talking about sitting kids down for two hours to watch educational, even educational television. But I visited a Phoenix House Rehabilitation Center in the last few years, and what I was amazed at, they were teaching about World War II, and they were showing movies to these kids, like G.I. Joe, and really? to get them interested in the battles. And so, but it was a wonderful, it was good? Oh, it was a great way to get them. And then once you got them in, you could, once you got them into church, you could preach. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask some questions. After I asked Joan, who retired from a children's television workshop, what her new projects are. Well, I retired as CEO. I never retired from the workshop. I have an office there and go in every day. And... Uh, and I'm on the board. And so you still do something there. And I'm kind of a internal godmother. <laughs> right, St. <Saint> Joan. 
And, uh, so. uh, and, and people like, I mean, I have, I love the future. I am not at all, a, you know, I love digital. I love everything that we can do to educate children. So I keep up pretty well. on. And that's the direction that says Oh Sesame. yeah, everything's going right. digital. Pretty soon we'll be watching Big Bird on our little <laughs> That <lunches>. is right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, but you were also starting a foundation. Well, it's not a foundation. It's a fund that my, st my husband is setting up for my stepdaughter and me to spend on poverty issues, mainly in New York City and education and preschool. And so I'll be able to give away significant money in the next few years to, to uh, trying to alleviate poverty and help with education. Early, both early education, and I'm even interested in uh, uh, some prisons now have college programs, and so that these prisoners leave with a BA. But it's very hard to get the money raised, and so I, 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 uh, Ford Foundation's interested, so we can make some partnerships, I think. Wow, that's great. Yeah. And that would be national. Not just... Oh, yes, yeah, that yeah. would be national. Or you could choose a New York prison. I mean, if we decide to go, that we want it all New York. That's, that's thrilling. It is. It's the new dream. It's it the is. new Joan Cooney dream. Um, okay, so um, I'll, I'll come back and ask one final question. But uh, do we have questions from the audience? You can ask her about Because if you don't, I will. Go ahead. So I'm sure you have many examples, but what stands out as the most blatant example of sexism other than your hiring and wanting to be deputy of your own company? Um, and what was your response? I have not personally encountered much sexism because for one thing, I started out in this company as the boss. And uh, television, and I suspect many companies, are almost military, I think you'll agree. In there, whoever the boss is, is the yeah. boss. There is no questioning. Uh, in fact, one producer once said to me, I don't think of you as a man or a woman. I think of you as a good or bad executive. And I think that was the attitude, because they knew I was the founder. And, um, mm -hmm. and also, I, I had a... I gave the producers, and that's all they're interested in, is a fair amount of creative freedom. I, I, I governed by exception. I moved in if I thought they were violating policy or creating an unnecessary controversy. I kept saying, we're not taking on unnecessary controversies. It's not going to happen. Uh, so that was the only time I would intervene uh, and so that they were very appreciative and eventually one of them said I, I said to me it is so nice not to have a boss that you feel competitive with <coughs> a, a man, man said that a man said that so and I don't think the women ever did anyway I mean they were happy to have a woman boss but it was um, you must have Remember, been a very good it boss, because <laughs> John, a lot of women don't feel that way. So a lot of, but this was a nonprofit. It was education. It was things that women that it's not odd for a woman to be right. involved in. Even even in the '60s. Even in the '60s, which was still exceptional. a woman boss was odd. <laughs> yes, but and not to be involved in education and. So I'd love to know something about the outcomes or the impact that CTW may have measured over the years about how the program has really helped children. Well, it, initially we did very, very careful research with both with inside and outside uh, research groups so that it wasn't our work that was, and, and it was very favorable to, I mean, in terms of our meeting, our goals. We always did what we called uh, formative research, was taking material out as it was being produced and changing it if children didn't get what we were trying to teach from the piece. So the show was really formed based on a lot of research of what they liked and what they learned. 
because both were essential, that they enjoyed it, watched it. We did something called distractor studies where we would play the show and, and click on, so they'd hear the click, a very attractive picture on another screen of an ice cream cone, a kid riding a bicycle, and we gauge the success of the material of whether they looked away or not at the distract <laughs> at the distractor machine. Um, so it was uh, a lot of very careful research was done. Less so, we still do a lot, but less of that, of what I call formative research where there's feedback to producers, but we still do some. But we don't do evalu uh, the, nearly as much evaluation of the we're pretty sure now what we're doing. Uh, did, did you ever do a study of whether kids who watch Sesame Street do better in school, that kind of thing? We did a longevity study, and they did um, do better. Uh, the problem now, in this, remember, in the 60s and 70s, many women were still home and, and were co-viewing, co it was called, with their children. and. Um, and that it turned out that that discussion that would ensue with the parent or the parent saying, "No, notice what that is. That's a parrot, or that's a you know," uh, was very helpful. Co-viewing, yeah, with is extremely helpful to learning. It's now it would be, it's inconceivable for parents, and I as a grandparent know exactly why to sit and watch television with your child because if you're caring for a child to get them to watch TV so you can take a shower or make a phone call <laughs> is exactly what you dream of. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's co-viewing is not so much anymore and, and therefore I don't Too think bad. it's as effective educationally as it could be. But yeah, because uh, the mothers are at work the now. The mothers are at work, and yeah. the caregivers are not really the same for the most part. Interesting. I have another question. Does anybody else? There, there are three questions. Okay, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. Um, just a kind of a follow-up on that question. Aside from the you know, sort of valuable academic side of uh, what you could measure in terms of improvement, the more subtle... Uh, benefits that accrued from, let's say, positive role models that, you know, mm -hmm. Sesame Street just generated and how that's so critical today, just to have those positive role models, because we could kind of ex expand that elsewhere. Good it's question. It's hard to measure. It's, it's very hard to measure that uh, we just continue to believe that to show people being kind to one another, accepting differences, is it has an effect it's uh, and and we truly believe it does uh, what we're trying to do now which is more concrete and uh, in addition to showing kindness to others being helpful to others accepting differences which is very important uh, is something called executive functioning which is the new curriculum issue everywhere and that is the child's ability to control impulses and concentrate on work. And um, it's very important, and it's why it's a child who has ADD, and seems, it seems in this day and age that many do, particularly boys, cannot, has no, really not enough executive functioning, a control of impulses usually because they're easily distracted. So we're teaching much more of that. Cookie Monster more and more tries not to eat a cookie when it comes <laughs> for some reason to show that there's delayed, you can delay gratification. And uh, whether it will make a difference, I don't know, but you, things that we do on Sesame Street are often, the, the adults pick up on it, teachers, pick up on it. Remember, teachers are usually often parents, too. And so it's the, our doing it in and of itself and being written about affects it. And uh, 
But it's a very big issue, which it wasn't when we started, this so-called executive functioning. And I, because I, I, one of my grandchildren has ADD and has executive functioning problems, know exactly what, it, I mean, I, what they're talking about, uh, the educators, and, and I see exactly, actually, exactly how it affects learning and how it has to, you have to help the child gain it or, or they can't get through school. Did you ever imagine that um, Sesame Street would have the international success that it has? Never. That was the biggest shock of my entire experience with Sesame Street. As I said, I thought we were creating the quintessential hip American show. And then I never dreamed it would have appeal abroad. But it was thanks to preschool education was catching on abroad too as a, as a new issue and a new necessity. And then the Muppets made a huge difference because they were so internationally beloved as it turned out. And so it, it made the show exceptionally um, well received in uh, th their versions. Every country made its own version. But their versions all had Muppets, all had the same taught alphabets, taught early reading skills, and so on. And, uh, and this acceptance of differences. That was one of the biggest things to us, was to make sure that was in the curriculum. Because every country has its own problems on differences. And they're getting more so now with, with these populations moving, foreign populations moving into um, the movement of populations from one country to another so that there's a huge African and uh, Muslim population in England now. So they're very interested in the uh, acceptance of differences. They don't do it via Sesame Street, but there is, they've worked with, they're working with us on projects. And what about the humor? Was that the idea to make it so funny? Was that Jim well, Henson? I, I, I know. I, I actually, I said to the producers as I hired them, let's do a kid's version of... Uh, Laughing? Laughing. Thank you. Why did I even I know where you were going? I was going to blank the most important part. Um, <laughs> it was... I had read that Laugh In was the most popular adult show on the air with two and three year olds. Well, I'm, I misunderstood it because I think it was popular because their parents had it on. <laughs> sure. But it seemed, I thought, you know, I'd been, been told by experts that these children had these short attention spans, and so it was a, seemed like a perfect format. And it obviously worked in terms of getting audience and teaching kids. It was all fun. But as time went on, we realized that children had great attention spans and that they liked stories, that it didn't... That they, they didn't want you to flit so much. No. Huh. So that we gradually expanded pieces and told stories. Yeah. And, and, it, and had recurring characters and stories that, that yes. went on the next show. Yes. Yeah. And so it was... Um, it was a quite a wake up because all the experts had said to us, remember the short attention spans. I, with grandchildren, was watching it long before they were two with some of them. And they would just sit there and watch 45 minutes or an hour of Sesame Street. And I thought, where did this attention span situation come from? So we were, mis we were misinformed <laughs> by the experts. Um, I have the mic. Oh, good. Okay, good. Uh, so much of the learning um, seems to happen through music um, on Sesame Street. Uh, and even I remember so, so much information that came through, um, you know, through the songs. Was that originally built in? or? Well, I forgot to mention that when we talk about Jim Henson, we should also mention Joe Raposo. Oh. who was this genius mu musician, songwriter, band leader, who came to, who we somehow got lucky with, as we did with Henson. They knew each other, so it was a group of pals, and one of the producers, so that these were people who had worked together before, and they loved 
coming back together. Joe was a genius, and he wrote wonderful songs, teaching songs, and, and, and he sang many of them and did character voices. You don't know it's Joe Raposo, I mean, that he was also performing much of the time. But he, the, the music was, was really part of, of what made it educational. He, it was attractive music, but it also always had a purpose. And so it was, music was a very important part of Sesame Street and was pointed out by music critics. But major articles were done in the New York Times by their music critics on the music of Sesame Street. It was that unusual. Sinatra became a great fan of Joe Raposo's and Joe wrote music for Sinatra. So, several Didn't several. Sinatra sing the the Kermit Green, Green it's song? It's not that easy being green, yeah. which was Joe's. And, and Sinatra sang that? Yes. yes. Is that it why? Because of Joe? Yes. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Joe was my friend, too. Yeah. Um, All of our people, by when we say was, everyone died young. It was just the most tragic place. These men did not take care of themselves that were our geniuses. and so that we lost a lot. You know, the, this idea about music, we, we remember music in a different part of our brain than we remember other things. And you've also seen these uh, shows on television, maybe even 60 Minutes once, I think Morley did a piece, on people who uh, had uh, problems remembering, brain damage, whatever, but they could remember songs. and. So, and, and usually what we learn through a song, we, re, we retain better. Really? Really. Um, a lot of kids well, that's memorize the Declaration sure. of Independence with a song that's out there, and they remember it. My daughter, for instance, she could still get up here and sing that entire song to you, and none of us <laughs> could recite the Declaration of Independence. Um, any more? Yep. Um, if you were to start Sesame Street today, what would you do different, differently? Oh, it's such a different world. In the first place, I don't know that you would create a television show first. It's all so digital. That what you'd create is content. I don't even know that you would go for, uh, to create a television show. I think of us as a content provider for all media, the digital and so on, because we're on YouTube and we're in all the digital, on the, all the digital platforms with short versions, pieces, and, you know, not necessarily whole shows. Uh, but we're also, uh, ha we still consider the television show our, it's the primary source that children learn about Sesame Street. Preschoolers are the last big audience for television among children. By the time they're six, seven, eight, they're all on digital platforms, uh, iPads, iPhones, uh, smartphones, whatever. And uh, in fact, someone's, it was maybe was on uh, one of those um, pieces that get go viral on uh, the internet, but this little child trying to sweep the TV set. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, how funny. How funny! So it's um, it's a multilingual world, as it was, as it were, with these platforms, and we are right there trying to keep up. And it's a job, but it's very worth doing. Should we wrap up? Okay. So I, I want to tell everybody what I've learned. Don't listen to experts. <laughs> they were wrong a lot with you. Yes, some, some, yeah, were, right. some were very helpful. No, but they've got things wrong about, you taught them things. and, and well, a They lot learned things. They didn't you. know television. They, almost none of the academics knew much about television. They were intrigued with the idea and wanted to be helpful. But they hadn't done any of the research. so and They, they hadn't you, watched right. children watch television. It's amazing. 
I mean, all of if you didn't grow up with it yourself, you had a child who grew up with it. So it really is an integral part of every American's life. Yes. I know. Yes. And so this makes me say, as my final point, is that the character that I think you're most like <laughs> is Big Bird oh, that's because good. you're big of spirit, big of generosity, and big of great ideas. Oh, St. Joan. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, it's been a real pleasure, and I, I certainly thank you all for coming and for asking me here, and um, just many, many thanks. Fun. Thank you. Thank you very much.